This will come as a surprise to none of you, but many of us here really love architectural models and drawings. Especially Kate, who's seen plenty of them in her time rebuilding plenty of houses over the years. Frankly, architectural models and drawings really are an art form. The stylized trees, the empty landscapes with just some happy people meandering through, maybe a car here or there. They always present an idealised version of a space, and the same is often true for advertisements for charging station infrastructure. When you look at pictures of these charging stations bathed in beautiful sunlight, surrounded by shiny happy people, possibly shiny happy people holding hands, everything looks great. Some networks like to use their fancier charging stations with solar roofs in their ads, adding to the impression that charging stations are great places to stop and kill a few minutes, maybe sucking down some cold brew and chewing on a bagel filled with fresh local produce while your EV tops up with renewably sourced electrons. So far so lovely, but that bucolic picture is not really very well aligned with reality. Recently we've talked about urban charging deserts. That video was linked up here and also in the description below. In it we talked about places where there aren't charging stations, but there very much should be. And that caused quite a lot of comments to be made. And yes, now I'm sure some of you are thinking, what now? She's going to complain about charging stations that do exist? Yeah, I am. Because even when there are stations, sometimes they aren't in the best spot or the facilities that surround them are lacking. And look, things are a bit different in much of Europe. Across Europe and the United States, alongside major highways and motorways, there are rest areas. In the US, safety rest areas were built as part of the interstate highway system. In Europe, service areas, or colloquially services, serve much the same function, giving folks a space to rest and recuperate, and have largely been built alongside motorways in a very similar manner. And depending on where you are in the world, those rest stops can be commercial, as they are in the UK and much of Europe, where they'll usually have a hotel, somewhere to eat, somewhere to pee, a petrol station, and sometimes a delightful picnic spot. Sometimes they'll be super fancy with a farm store and carefully curated deli, like my old favourite stop near Gloucester, a stop that I think everyone who works here who used to live in the UK misses. And sometimes they'll be dispiriting and dismal. Elsewhere in the world, sometimes they'll be non-commercial, as is much of in the US, where highway rest stops are very often much differentiated from streams of commercial spaces alongside freeways. If you want food in a hotel, that'll mean pulling off and hitting up one of the endless chains of motels that border freeway edges. But for many states, though, rest stops have nothing beyond a toilet, maybe some volunteers serving free coffee, and some nice little picnic benches. If they've gone really wild, you might find a vending machine. They are perfunctory for peeing, letting your dog pee, and finding a place to eat your picnic and that's about it. And maybe a place to read the DO NOT FEED THE BEARS sign while scaring your children. This is because commercial pressure led to the rest stops explicitly being banned from engaging in commerce to protect income for the small towns the new interstates passed through. At a federal level, the government actually does not allow automotive service stations or other commercial establishments for serving motor vehicle users to be constructed or located on the interstate highway system. As an aside, rest stops on the east coast of the US sometimes do have charging stations. How they skirt this federal law is a question I don't yet know the answer to, so if you do know, drop me a line in the comments below. Although, come to think of it, some US West Coast rest stops also have charging stations, so again, I'm not sure how they accomplish that. At any rate, across much of the US, that rule has led to an interesting dichotomy. Well, that and probably in part, the switch in Europe to Tesla's having CCS connectors and thus Europe effectively standardising on one single charging connector, because Chademo is being just as much neglected as in Europe as it is in America. In the US, charging stations are frequently placed in conjunction with a major chain. On the west coast, that's often a Target or a Walmart, and the charging stations are often found lurking at the back of parking lots in poorly lit, isolated corners. Sometimes, particularly for older networks like the Air Environment Network, now owned by Wabasto, they're hidden around the back of gas stations and forgotten. Sometimes stations have been so well hidden that I've had to do a couple of laps in a mall parking lot to find it. And this reliance on using existing infrastructure positioned away from highways to support charger rollout has led to some problems. Problems that have been made far much more visible by the temporary closure of many malls and restaurants during COVID, which leaves some folks with EVs charging at locations without access to food or restrooms. 
And that's before you even talk about finding the blinking station. I've been on road trips where it took me a while to find the charging stations I'd chosen to use on my route. The pin on the map wasn't quite in the right spot, and I was tired. Then I found the nearest open place to get food and use the loo was 20 minutes walk away, so I ended up driving there first, peeing, getting takeout, and then coming back to charge. And yes, I know that Tesla chargers are much easier to find, since Tesla keeps care of all of the mapping, but that doesn't solve the other part of this problem. Because, you know, there are many people who drive non-Tesla EVs. Given that it was getting dark, which I can't say I was super comfortable with in the poorly lit back of a parking lot as a lone queer woman, I mean, I wasn't being slow rolled by guys in pickup trucks which used to happen at one charging station I had to plug in on my way to Seattle, or it wasn't like the charging station on the I-5 which was near a homestyle diner who wasn't anywhere near full when I walked in with my partner wanting to grab an eat to bite, only to be told no, they were full, and we'd be better off finding a place further up the I-5 that would suit my kind. Gotta love people's attitudes to paying customers, eh? But an empty car park at night? That kind of lonely place gets my Dorothy B. Hughes vibes tingling. And at least it wasn't raining, since nearly all charging stops I've used have no shelter at all. No matter whether they actually have pretty and sensible solar shades in all of their fancy brochures and press materials. There are a vanishingly small number that actually provide you cover. Then there's the long-standing problem of accessibility. At most gas stations, not in Oregon or New Jersey because they have to pump your gas for you, those who have physical issues that make pumping gas difficult can press a button for assistance, even if they are at a self-serve pump. While that may mean a bit of a wait, there is at least service there. But there's no such luck at EV charging stations. All you can do if you can't physically manipulate the charger plug into the socket for whatever reason is to rely on the kindness of strangers, which is no way to build inclusive transportation infrastructure. And while most gas stations are accessible to vehicles with adaptations to assist those with physical disabilities, many EV charging stations in the US are in cramped spaces where anything bigger than a mid-sized sedan will struggle to get in. And there's requirements about vehicle orientation that may make exiting the vehicle difficult. I know I've had some chargers with cables so short and bollards so far out that getting my car in close enough proximity to charge while at the same time being able to get out has been tricky. Electrify America, for the most part. I'm looking at you here. And that experience of scrabbling my way out of the car while trying to avoid whacking my door against a badly placed post is from someone with no mobility issues, other than the slow, steady decline towards death that we all enjoy. Consider what it's like trying to extricate yourself to charge your car when using a mobility aid in one of those cramped spaces. Now, a possible solution to this is what we've seen in Europe, where the chargers are often located at service stations, with their 24-hour opening, accessible spaces, and availability of food and bathrooms. Not only that, but often front and centre, right next to the door, in the always open, well-lit service space with its security staff and management. In the US, that might mean having chargers positioned at businesses that are open, reliably, 24-7. But unfortunately, the most common 24-7 businesses we know of is gas stations. That said, as the various fossil fuel companies have started to see the writing on the wall for their traditional method of making money, several of them have started to move into the charging business. Surprise, surprise. Shell, Total and BP have all bought charging networks, and Shell, even before its recent purchase of European network Ubitricity, already operated over 1,000 DC charging stations at 430 gas stations. Someone with the lights on and staff to support those who need it? That's definitely a step up. But gas stations are hardly the greatest place to kill half an hour. Or even less. Hell, I've had enough tedious conversations while pumping gas for more than a lifetime. Or curious people asking if I need help with my classic car engine when I'm literally just checking the washer fluid. And also, no, it's not my boyfriend's motorbike, and I don't need you to fill it up for me. So maybe a better possibility is the introduction of charging stops like the GridServe service station that recently opened in the UK. These purpose-built facilities have a space for a charging of a large number of vehicles, have staff on site who can assist those who need it, and have niceties so you can grab a coffee and when you need a break, sit somewhere comfortable while the juice flows into your vehicle. Oh, and if you need to empty yourself of juices, you're not stuck wandering around trying to find a store that has a public loo that is actually clean and will let you use it without buying some random item you don't need. While charging times are definitely decreasing, and with plug and charge integrating payment, the process is getting simpler, quicker, and more reliable. But there's always going to be a need for the humans involved to 
be humans. And unless we get totally automated connection, really widespread battery swapping or rapid inductive charging, all of which are, well, improbable right now, there's always going to be a need for some folks to have assistance plugging in. So while the rollout of much improved charging networks is a definitely marked progress, I think I'm going to have to give it a good B. It's a good start, but it definitely needs improvement and could be better. What do you think? Now that's it for today. Please do hit subscribe and the bell if you haven't yet, as it stops YouTube from doing weird things with our content. And make sure that you're subscribed to both Transport Evolved Take Two and Transport Evolved Shorts. There are links below. Thanks on behalf of the entire TE crew, go out to the folks on my right for being our $15 to $49 a month patron supporters. Special thanks to our $50 a month patrons, that's Andrew Martin, Guido Drahoa, Brophy Wolf, Anonymous Freak, Regine Fellows, Carl Hodgson, Gordon C, Paul Conway, Laura Sanborn, Anthony Coates, Denny Hyde, Sean Ueda, and Taza in the Gong. And our deepest gratitude to our $100 a month Patreon supporters, John Lyons, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, JP Fagerback, Will Graylin, and Ian. And someone says they want and Ian to be on a t-shirt. Let us know below if that's true. If you'd like to join the ranks of wonderful supporters, you'll find links below to Patreon, Bitcoin, and Kofi, and you can chat with the fans at TE over on Discord. And if you want some TE swag, just head over to our Redbubble store. Our new pride designs are now in stock, and all proceeds from this month goes to the Trevor Project. Thanks for joining me, and as always, keep evolving!